This is the best of first and last, the podcast. Welcome into first and last on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. I am Will Reeve. In for Mike Golick Jr. We'll get into Golick's whereabouts in a little bit. I am joined remotely by Mo Egger of ESPN 1530. Tweet at us, at Reeve Will, at Mo Egger 1530. And hey, at Mo Egger 1530, how are you this morning? I'm well. How about you? I'm doing quite well. Not as well as the Golden State Warriors, though. <laughs> Dominating the Cavs at Oracle, winning by 22 points. And to be honest, it wasn't even really that close. No, it was like a really good, entertaining first quarter. And then at the half, you're kind of looking at it going, all right, uh, Cleveland's turning it over a ton. Golden State's missing open looks. They're missing shots in the paint, and yet they're still in control in this game. And and you never really felt like – the game was weird to me because and, – and Mike Breen made an allusion to this on the TV broadcast on, on ABC. It, the game was played at times at a frenetic pace, almost too fast for Cleveland. And yet they couldn't slow it down, and they don't want to slow it down too much. Um, it, it was – you know, here's the troubling thing. You think back to last year, right? Last year, game one, Golden State wins by 15 points. There was a time in that game where Cleveland storms all the way back, and yet it kind of felt like the, the door was left open a little bit because Steph Curry didn't shoot that well in game one last year. Klay Thompson didn't, sh- didn't shoot all that well in game one last year. Last night, Steph Curry was great in the fourth quarter. Kevin Durant was great for all four quarters, and then no one else did anything. And it just it, 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 the game one this year feels different than game one last year. Game one last year... And I know Golden State followed it up with a blowout win in Game 2, but you could kind of see where some of the seeds would be planted for a Cleveland comeback. I didn't see any of that last night, especially with the way they were sloppy with the basketball and especially with the way that they couldn't seem to get the pace where they needed to be, and that's that's troubling for Cleveland. It definitely looks bleak for Cleveland after one game. You mentioned the margin of victory for the Warriors. Coming into this series, they have a 16.5-point average margin of victory that's an NBA record and they only increased that last night and and you mentioned last year's margin of victory in the first couple games they won game one by 15 and then they won by 33 in game two so and and then for the first six games up until game seven the the average margin of victory swinging both ways was almost 20 points so there, there there were discrepancies there were disparities between the two teams last year and and those were apparent on the floor last night the Cavs couldn't really get anything going you alluded to the pace of the game we know that the Warriors are built to play fast they get up and down they play stifling defense and then they're super efficient on offense but the Cavs tried to match them in that efficiency and in that speed and you could kind of tell listening to the radio broadcast in fact Hubie Brown who knows everything there is to know about basketball said the Cavs wouldn't be able to keep that up and he was absolutely right. Even in the beginning of the first quarter, they they were pushing, and they weren't really getting any of their shots to fall, which is problematic no matter how fast you're going. But to to be tiring yourselves out at the hands of the Warriors who just keep coming in waves, you got Clay Thompson, an all-star, one of the best scorers in the game, only scores six points, and you still win by 22. You know you're loaded that way. So the Cavs have some have some returning to the drawing board to do, and I'm interested to see what they will do on Sunday in Game 2 to address the myriad problems that they uh, show showed on uh, last night's game. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 got to start on the defensive end. And uh, look, can Cleveland defend better? Yeah. Are, are they going to be able to get enough stops? Because, you know, we can, we can make all the comparisons to last year that we want. The most important guy in the court last night wasn't there last year, and that was obviously Kevin Durant. I, I, I just don't know if the totality – of Golden State's offense across this series. Look, Cleveland's going to win games. Um, Because I, I, I keep coming back to last year, or two years ago, LeBron, when his, his running mates were uh, Matthew Dellavedova and Timothy Mozgov, he still won two games. I, I, you, you're going to have a hard time convincing me that Cleveland can't make this a series. But when I look at it, the totality of, of Golden State's offense, I, I don't know how Cleveland gets enough stops. I mean, last night it felt like Golden State got every shot they wanted. They scored 113 points on a night where I think in the second quarter alone they missed eight shots in the paint. In the second quarter alone, Clay Thompson, you don't see him shoot as poorly as he did last night. It wasn't just that he was missing. He was missing really badly. Uh, he and Draymond Green combined went, what, 6 of six of 28? That's not going to happen all that often. And so what Kevin Durant did last night, that's going to happen often. What, what Steph Curry was able to do, and he missed some layups, that's going to happen often. Um, Golden State's bench production. You're, all right, that's they're probably going to get more than Cleveland does. 
I I just don't know, especially when when not if Clay starts to make outside shots, when not if Kevin Durant or uh, Draymond Green's more of an offensive factor. I just don't know how they how they get stops. I don't I don't care if you're playing fast. I don't care if you're you're grinding grinding out possessions. I don't know where the the defense across the course of this series enough for Cleveland to win four games is going to come from. I am Will Reeve. He is Mo Egger. This is First and Last, and that was Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. Straight Talk Wireless, nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. And I implored you out there, wherever you are, to call us at 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. The phone lines, much like my DMs, are open, and we have John in Massachusetts. John, how are you? I'm pretty good. I'd, I'd just like to know how the greatest player on earth, LeBron James, and all these players that get so much more rest, better nutrition, better travel, and better accommodations than any of the players back in the day are unable to perform with so much rest. I mean, how in the world could they possibly be tired? He sat out all those games all year. Oh, it's just, I'm just so sad for him. I mean, and now he's going to, ch- I, I don't believe what he said about the thing written on his fence. And I, I feel like he's doing that so he can say he, over- he overcame so many things, or if he loses, he'll have a built in excuse to explain. Well, John, I, I, I don't think that what was written which uh, on, on LeBron James's gate at his Brentwood, uh, Los Angeles home, the racial slur that's being investigated as not only vandalism, but as a hate crime, as terrible as that is. I don't think that really has a place in our discussion for game one, and I don't even think that the rest argument has a place uh, in terms of discussion for game one. LeBron James played 40 minutes, and he went for 28 points, 15 rebounds, 8 assists. He was a minus 22, uh, but that's also a product of being on the court for so long, and he had a bunch of turnovers. He didn't, he didn't look... He looked great in the first half, and especially the first quarter when they were pushing the pace. He was leading his team as he often, and actually, in fact, always does. And I think that, to be honest, he ran into a buzzsaw. The Warriors are no slouches. They've got four of the best players on earth. They've got two MVPs on the team. Kevin Durant is the second best player, for my money, on the in the world, and certainly on the court, obviously. So, Mo, I'm interested to hear your take on... Does does that rest argument or anything have any merit, or are the Warriors just that good? The, the Golden State they they could have played uh, with with four hours rest instead of nine days rest, and and it wouldn't have mattered last night. It's it to me it's it's not about rest. It's not about the amount of time between games. It's it's not about manufacturing reasons to get mad at LeBron James, which there'll be no shortage of uh, every time he you know turns the ball over or steps the other way in this series. It, it's it's a matter of of the Golden State Warriors having four of the top twenty to twenty five players in the NBA on their team, and two of them were awesome last night. Look, the rest thing, and I know we love to hammer away at LeBron James. LeBron's asked to do everything. He's a guy who averaged uh, more minutes per game than anybody in the NBA this year. This is a guy who's played in seven straight finals. That's a great accomplishment. That means he's logging 100 games a year every single year, playing deep into June every single year. And then in a scenario like last night where the game is really fast, where he's not going to be given much rest during the game as is, and you're asking him to do everything the Cavaliers are asking him to do, yes, at some point in the game maybe fatigue becomes a factor. But I, I don't care if LeBron was at his best last night. Um, it wasn't going to be enough, and, and we could talk about who didn't show up on Golden State's team despite the fact that they won. Cleveland, Tristan Thompson, non-factor. Uh, J.R. Smith, non-factor. Uh, Kevin Love grabbed a bunch of rebounds because he happened to be there around Golden State's misses, but offensively, kind of a non-factor. Their bench, not Richard Jefferson, who's like older than me, and I'm going to be 40 in October, was their only factor off the bench. It, this wasn't about LeBron not having enough rest, having too much rest, not being good enough last night. The Cleveland Cavaliers last night were not as good enough, were not as good as the Golden State Warriors. Most teams when Golden State uh, has those two guys, Steph and Kevin Durant playing the way they did last night, aren't going to be good enough. Look, we, we do this with LeBron all the time. He lost game 3 
to the Boston Celtics. We talked more about that one loss than we did any of his 12 playoff wins this year. So we're going to make every failure by the Cleveland Cavaliers out to be an indictment against LeBron James, and that's massively unfair. If your big takeaway last night was LeBron's making excuses and LeBron's coming up with reasons to deflect attention from how he loses this series, you were watching a different game because my biggest takeaway last night was, wow, Kevin Durant's unstoppable, and that Golden State team, when they get going, is going to be almost impossible for this Cavaliers team to defend. First and last, the podcast. It was a blowout. Not what I expected, but maybe it was because the Warriors are pretty good. I, I was thinking about this in the break. I, I Nothing that the Warriors did, Mo, surprised me, except for maybe Klay Thompson being a non-factor on the offensive side of things. I think that the Warriors were what we all thought they were, a juggernaut. Well, first of all, I mean you're you're coming you're coming at me with the hottest of takes that the Warriors are pretty good. I know. I need to I, slow down barrel, a little I'm bit. Sorry. Okay, that's, I'll I'll turn down you're, the temperature. You're, a little you're bit. just trying to to get attention. You're just I mean just you know relax. I'm trying to go viral. I'm trying to go viral at at, at three nineteen the, on the, the East Coast. Here. The, the takes are are coming hot. No, I mean little little about what Golden State did uh, surprised me. I I think this is. For this to be a series, this is about how Cleveland adjusts because you know what what you saw from Golden State last night. You, you, to me, you're you're going to get some version of that every game of this series. Now, maybe Kevin Durant doesn't go off the way he did. Maybe he doesn't score quite at the pace that he did in Game One. But like someone's going to get their points. They just they have too many guys. They have too many weapons. So if it's not Durant and Steph, maybe it's it's Durant and and Clay in Game Two, or, or Draymond Green scores more with Steph Curry. They're going to get points. To to me, it's it's about how Cleveland adjusts. And so, if you're Tyron Lou, do you try to outscore them? And if you, if you looked at the lineup they had on the court last night, often it felt like that's what they were trying to do, because Tristan Thompson, who at times last year in the finals was so valuable, he didn't play as much. At that, there were times last night where Kyle Korver and Richard Jefferson and Kevin Love were on the court together. That's an offensive lineup. You're not getting stops with that bunch. And so do you do you tweak the rotation to go a little bit more defensive and just hope you can figure out a way to get stops, which nobody in this league has figured out how to do against this team, or do you try to outscore them? And if you do that, you're telling LeBron James and Kyrie Irving to do even more. I, I Look, I, I think this is about how now Cleveland adjusts moving forward. I think they win games in this series because LeBron is just too much to handle. Obviously, the series is going to shift back to Cleveland for games three and four. But to to win this series, Cleveland is going to have to figure out a way. Do we either do things to get stops, and how do we do that, or do we outscore this team, and do we have the firepower to be able to do that? And if we do that, how much does that come at the expense of getting stops on defense? I've learned never to count out LeBron James. That's that would be my first line of defense if I'm if I'm a Cavs fan, and to be frank, if I'm a member of the Cavs organization, I would say we've got LeBron James. He, alongside in in 2015, alongside Matthew Dellavedova, Timothy Mozgov, and a few other misfit toys, was able to push the Warriors, the best team in the league that year, to six games. In a historic finals performance, many people saying that he should have won the MVP that year, even in a losing effort. And then, of course, last year, bringing the title to Cleveland, down 3-1, coming back to win in seven games at Oracle in Game 7, a historic performance that cemented him as one of the all-time all time greats, if not the greatest. So that all leads us to this series and the fact that even having said all that about LeBron James, about how great he is and how he can will his team to victory, they still got blown out by 22. To me, I don't, I don't know if there's an answer, but I also don't think that the series is over because they have LeBron James and because there is no way that he's going to go quietly into that good night. So I wonder what more he can do. He did have eight turnovers, so one easy thing to point to is that he can protect the ball better. Mm-hmm. But but protecting the ball better isn't translating into 22 points. That's a big deficit. So I wonder what can he do because the Cavs go as LeBron goes. Right. So what more can he do? He scored 28 points. He was... He was fired up. He is the leader of that team. He's the heartbeat of the team, heartbeat of the league for that matter. And I just wonder what else he can do to possibly compete with the Warriors because I don't think it's over, but all I'm pointing to is the fact that LeBron James is LeBron James. But I feel like 
I, I got to come armed with more information than that, and I'm wondering if you have any for me. Well, I don't. I don't know if I. I don't have the answers, and I. I don't know what information I have. But I, we talked about the pace of the game last night, and you know the word frenetic has been used a lot. It was used last night during the broadcast. Often it was frenetic, and it felt like it was too fast for Cleveland. Now there's there's a part of there's a part of you that goes, yeah, LeBron James in the open court. Um, what what's better than that for Cleveland? Kyrie Irving in the open court. What's better than that? And yet, when I when I think of LeBron in this series, it's it's kind of how it was two years ago, where they did a pretty good job in games two and three of slowing the game down just enough. LeBron is the best in the NBA at in the half court finding holes in defenses, exploiting mismatches. You could post him up a little bit more, um, and, and so I I think therein lies the answer for him, and and maybe. That doesn't translate into more statistical production, although I certainly think there's a, a gear that LeBron James can hit. We've seen him do this a thousand times. I think there's a gear that Le- LeBron James can hit where he scores more than the 28 that he had last night, but I think you have to do it within the context of a slower-played game, of of a, of a pace that favors using LeBron in ways that maybe he couldn't be used last night where you allow him to create one-on-one matchups in, in the half court. You allow him to run down to the block. You get him, um, maybe not on the run, but you get him against a player that he could take to the basket. I think there's ways to do that with him in the half court. Now, that that sounds easy. That's not easy when you're playing this Golden State team because there's a very lengthy list of teams, including the Cavaliers, who have tried to slow down the Golden State Warriors and can't. We we saw it often in the Western Conference playoffs. We saw a, a, a compromised San Antonio Spurs team try to do that in the Western Conference finals, and it didn't work. But I think there lies the answer. Look, I'm I'm with you. You you don't count out any finalist in the NBA Finals after one game, especially before they've played a game on their home court, and especially when they have the guy who, for me, is still the most valuable player in this league. You don't count out LeBron James. But there's a difference between not counting him out and thinking he can get he and his teammates can get four victories. And with with, with the way Golden State comes at you in waves, and with the way Cleveland's going to have to figure out a way to strike a deli- delicate balance between playing fast but not too fast, I don't know how they do that to the to the extent where they can win four times in this series, especially with a game seven in Oakland. First and last, things looked like we were in for a heavyweight bout, a fight in the Coliseum, if you will. I was thinking like this: Are you not entertained? That's what I thought. That's what I thought we were going to get, Mo. I thought I thought LeBron James and Kevin Durant and Steph Curry and all the rest. We're going to be like gladiators out there trading blows, but then all of a sudden Zaza Pachulia had six of the of the Warriors' first ten points, and then nobody was making any shots, and everyone was saying, is there rust? What's going on? And I was thinking, maybe there's nerves, but then these guys have been there before. They're all vets. So I was like, what's going on? And then things settled in, and it all got really entertaining, and then just as quickly as it got good, it got kind of bad, especially so for the Cleveland Cavaliers who ended up losing game one in Oakland by a score of 113 to 91 and I want to get into some post-game sound here because we can talk and we have talked and we will talk all morning about what exactly happened in that game but let's hear it from from some of the guys involved and I want to focus first on coach Ty Lu. he had a front row seat to the destruction of his team at the hands of the Golden State Warriors he said that Golden State is pretty good they're the best I ever seen can you elaborate on that? <laughs> They're the best I ever seen. Okay, which, okay, okay. I mean, no other team has done this, right? Yeah. So you know, thirteen and zero, um, and they can they constantly break records every year. You know, last year being seven three and nine, this year starting playoffs thirteen and zero. So um, they're playing good basketball, but we can play better. The Cavs certainly can play better, Mo. What do you make of lose comments? Uh, Tyron Liu is is the same guy who said uh, after Game Two of the Boston series that the Celtics were more difficult to prepare for without Isaiah Thomas. If if he couldn't figure out a way, and this is harsh, a little too harsh, I guess. But if 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 he had a hard time game planning for the the Boston Celtics without their best guy, I would imagine that game planning for the Golden State Warriors, despite the fact that he did this a year ago, I would imagine that uh, preparing for the Golden State Warriors is is equally tough. If not more, I mean, look, I, I I can't imagine what it's like. I, I can't I can't imagine what it's like to to sit down, uh, even with all the time in the world they had to prepare to to sit down and figure out a way 
to to not stop but slow down the Golden State Warriors because you can really only do so much. Look, th- there were times last night, especially in the second half, because in, in the second quarter, Kevin Durant just kept attacking the rim. There were times last night where the defense on Kevin Durant was fine or the defense on Steph Curry was fine. The individual defense was, was fine, and the guy made the shot or the guy made the move or the guy found the open man. There's only so many things you can do. I mean, look, we've talked about adjustments. We'll, we'll continue to talk throughout the course of the morning about things the Cavaliers can do differently and changing the rotation and slowing the game down. But but at at, at the end of the day, they're going to have to figure out ways to, to get stops. They're going to have to figure out solutions for this offense. And nobody, again, nobody has been able to do that. I'm not sure that Tyron Lue, who is a very good coach, I'm not sure that he's going to be able to figure out how to do that. Ty Lue said in the last series, the Eastern Conference Finals, that the Celtics, uh, the stuff that they were running was harder to de- to defend than Golden State's offense, which everyone kind of made fun of at the time, and they certainly, I assume, are now after uh, after a 22-point loss at the hands of the Golden State Warriors. Whatever the Warriors ran last night seemed to work, and I'm sure you all agree with me out there, and, and we want to get to your calls on the Shell Pennzoil performance line. Let's open that up, take it for a spin. Remember, the number is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. Let's go, just because there's no way this is your real name, Frandy, in Miami. What do you got? Uh, <laughs> well, it's pronunciated Fwenzu is the French name. Oh, but, okay. But I'll take it, yeah. All right, well, um, Frandy, Fwenzu, whatever, I, it's a pleasure to have you on <laughs> with us on First and Last. What do you have for us? I appreciate it. No, nah, um, I mean, everyone knows. I mean, the thing is, we're betting that the Warriors don't sweep the Cavs. I think that's what we're hoping, that it'll be a gladiator match, like you said, from the first quarter. But I don't like, – like, you guys are talking about it, and, and everyone's going to agree. What, what what else do they have? Who else is going to come up and – I mean, they're not going to make any trade in the middle of the finals or you know, sign any players. Um, you got LeBron. The defense lacked this year. They're not as strong as it was last year. And then you got Kevin Durant to add on to a team that was already dynamic. I, uh, the first yeah, quarter was awesome. There's there's not much there's not much more to say there. When you add Kevin Durant to a team that won 73 games last year and was mere minutes away from winning their second title in a row uh, at the expense of the Cavaliers, Mo. There's not much more you can do if you're either team. They're pretty much maxed out. The Warriors are as good as they're probably going to get, and if they get any better, that's terrifying. And for the Cavs, it's probably terrifying to go up against a team like that. Sure. Look, we're going to do this often. Go back to last year. One of the things I remember most is how Steph Curry, as the NBA Finals dragged on, for the most part, didn't look like Steph Curry. And it was odd because in, in the latter stages of the NBA Finals last year, remember he threw his mouthpiece into the stands during Game Six in Cleveland, and it just it it just it kind of felt like uh, physically he wasn't where he needed to be. It sort of felt like all right, they put too much into going for the the record for most regular season wins. It kind of felt like things caught up to Steph Curry physically. Steph Curry's healthy this year. He's uh, looks better rested. They've asked him to do less. Uh, they weren't trying for 73 wins this year. They didn't come close to getting 73, 74 wins this year. So uh, that that factor is different this year than it was last year. But now, even if Steph Curry turns into a pumpkin again, where last year there wasn't Kevin Durant, now there is. I mean, you know, it's 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 an oversimplification, but it's it's hard to to move off of when when you looked at the series at the beginning and you go, okay, well, last year the the, the Warriors were a stop or two or a player two away from winning the series, and they led it three one. Um, now they have Kevin Durant, the best available score, one of the, the the great scorers this league has ever seen. Now they've added Kevin Durant, so a team that was up three one last year just added that guy. They'll win four games in the finals this year. That sounds like an oversimplification, but it really isn't. It really isn't. And so last year, as great as Golden State was, they weren't they weren't insulated enough to be able to withstand one of their best guys having an off series, having a bad couple of games. This year they are. You saw it last night. Clay Thompson was miserable shooting the basketball. Draymond Green, and they don't need him to score. But he certainly can score, didn't shoot the basketball well at all last night, and yet they were insulated enough to win the game going away. The fourth quarter was was a formality, not competitive. Last year, that wasn't the case because when, when Steph Curry was was struggling and they, they lose Draymond Green for game five, 
all right, well, who else is going to step up? The answer this year is someone, and that someone last night was was Kevin Durant. The Warriors absolutely played last night and have played all playoffs, and in fact, most of the year, as if they have something to prove. And the things to prove are different for or for each guy, and specifically Steph Curry and Kevin Durant. For Kevin Durant, he's gotten a lot of flack for his move, uh, joining the enemy, as it were, leaving Oklahoma City after losing a hard-fought uh, Western Conference Finals last year to join the Warriors and, and chase a ring. He's kind of damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. So he's got a lot to prove, and he proved that he is, for my money, the second best player in the world behind LeBron James with 38 points, eight rebounds, eight assists in his uh, first finals game with the Warriors. And then Steph Curry has sort of been knocked down a few pegs, even though he's the two-time reigning MVP. And he was not healthy last year, as you alluded to, Mo. So this year, he came out with a vengeance, and so he and Kevin Durant combined for 66 points, 18 assists, and 14 rebounds. When you got two guys doing that, you don't need other guys to do much, and the two other guys of the Big Four didn't do much. Clay Thompson had six points on 3 of 16 shooting. He was 0 for 5 from 3. Draymond was was playing defense, as was Clay, to be fair, but Draymond had only 9 points, but it didn't matter because they have two of the best players in the world. They got two MVPs on the floor at the same time. Even if they split them up, did like a John Calipari... Uh, Kentucky-style rotation and split Durant and Curry up, you'd still have an MVP on the floor at all times. So I, I, I don't see how the Cavs can overcome that, but I keep coming back to the fact that they have LeBron James. That is what I would hang my hat on to say that this series is far, 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 far from over. And I hope, given the relative boring nature of the regular season for the most part and the formality of the playoffs as it were with these two teams winning losing a combined one game there better be some pushback from the Cavs because I need to see more basketball yeah no they're you're hoping so because as as much as like I I keep using the the word inevitability it, it felt like from from the moment last year's NBA finals ended we knew we'd be back here with these two teams we, we knew it and the, the whole league knew it it's why there were not a lot of teams that really went all in at the trade deadline. It wasn't like, you know, I mean, heck, the Boston Celtics had a chance to make their team better and didn't. And they ended up winning more games in the Eastern Conference during the regular season than, than everybody because the whole league knew we can't beat Cleveland and Golden State. There would be nothing worse for the NBA than for this to be a short series, a four or five game series, because these are the two most important teams. These are the two best teams. And regardless of how this series ends, I think the minute the NBA Finals end this year, we're going to be thinking about Cavs Warriors Part 4 because right now, and the offseason will change things maybe just a little bit, right now it's hard to imagine anybody winning the East next year besides Cleveland and assuming that Kevin Durant's in Golden State next year and his reports that he's willing to take less money so they can keep the team intact, I think he's going to be with the Warriors next year. It's it's hard to imagine anybody in the West dethroning uh, Golden State. So it, it's going to be really bad for this league if this ends up, and we, we may be getting a little ahead of ourselves, but that's what we do. It's going to be really bad for this league if this series is not competitive and not very long because at least coming into this one, you went, okay, they went seven last year. They went six two years ago. We're going to get something long this year. If what we saw last night is the beginning of a series that doesn't go six, doesn't go seven, and gives us a bunch of non-competitive games, and Golden State walks to their second title in three years, and then at the end of it, we're thinking ahead to Cavs Warriors Part 4, man, that's not going to be very good. And so there's a lot of different reasons why the Cavaliers need to to make this a series. You and I wanting to watch more basketball is a reason, but man, for the league itself, when we knew that these were going to be the, the, the two teams in the finals all along, if we get something short and we get something non-competitive, and then we know we're going to get the same two teams 12 months from now. Man, that's not good. I think we're going to be all right. I have faith that this series is going to go going to go deep because some of the best players in the world are on either side of the ball. First and last. Kevin Durant, he of the 38 points, 8 assists, 8 rebounds on the Golden State Warriors, was shooting a free throw. And while he was shooting that free throw, Someone with very good seats yelled out something to him, and he heard it and responded with an, with an icy stare. So pay attention to this sound and, and see if you can make out what I'm talking about. Hundreds of millions of people around the world have been waiting for this since they went to camp in October. Maybe, Mo, if I said <laughs> brick, 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 you could understand it better, but that is, by all accounts, 
Rihanna, yes, that Rihanna, yelling, heckling, brick at Kevin Durant as he shoots a free throw in game one of the NBA Finals. And Durant responded by staring at her, staring her down. And then later on, Mo, Kevin Durant shot a three-pointer. It goes in, as most of Durant's shots did last night. And he stared at her again. And then he was asked about that because those moments blew up as expected on social media. And someone asked him about that at the postgame presser alongside Steph Curry. Toward the end of the game, uh, you shot a three, kind of putting the dagger into him. And you look toward the crowd, toward uh, Rihanna. Uh, was, was that uh, uh, on purpose or, or do you remember that? Or? I don't even remember that. <laughs> uh, well, just to let you know, social media is buzzing about really? it. Really? Yes. Don't get in that trap. Yeah, don't get in that trap. I'm cool. Have fun with that. (laughs) Well, you know what, Mo? To me, Rihanna is as close as we have to a modern-day Helen of Troy. So I would understand if Kevin Durant were to fall into that trap. But good for him, nailing that three and staring down his heckler, as famous as she might be. has, Has anybody who's ever looked at Rihanna from that vantage point not remembered? I like I look I, maybe it, Kevin if anyone were to not remember it, it would be Kevin Durant he's okay. on another level and he is there, there's no doubt about that but but is do, do you really believe that he he makes the shot and looks at Rian even if he wasn't staring her down and you said oh yeah you made the shot you looked over there was you would remember that you looked over and there was Rihanna you would certainly remember if you stared her down Mo, which you did man, my man if I were playing a game that Rihanna were watching. I would remember every single thing I did because every single thing I did would be in the service of trying to impress Rihanna. Yes. Did you guys hear Jeff Van Gundy? Yes, that's yeah. another she thing. Do we, in, have, she, we have that sound? We'll Can get we it. get that? Okay, just as a teaser for some more sound. LeBron James, in one of the few Cavaliers highlights of all of last night's game, threw down a vicious dunk over JaVale McGee. It was an absolute posterization. And all I remember from that moment is that Jeff Van Gundy was so distracted by Rihanna walking in front of him that he didn't even see the dunk. So as we work behind the scenes to get you that sound, our good old our colleague JVG getting distracted by, as I said, the modern-day Helen of Troy, the face, the star that would launch a 1,000 ships, the star that would launch a 1,000 shots from me if I were out on a basketball court and she were watching. We'll here's, get to that in a little bit. Here's who I felt bad for last night. So there was uh, there was a, a montage of famous people, and it, if I recall, it started with uh, Jesse Jackson, who's mm-hmm. obviously very famous, and it continues through uh, Kevin Hart, the actor who's made a billion movies, very and probably famous. a billion dollars, too, right? Yeah. yeah, and then they go to Jay Z, obviously very famous, and it ends with Rihanna, right? And so very famous, mm-hmm. and so the game continues, and then there were a couple of times when guys were either shooting free throws or there were shots over toward the bench where you would see sitting very close, uh, maybe courtside, maybe second row, I really can tell, but it, it's obvious who this guy was. The the dude from Counting Crows who looks like a Muppet, the lead singer, that Adam guy. Adam Duritz, he my, my has man quite could, the track record, by the way, so right. I don't know what you're about to say. But, but my man couldn't get a mention respect. last night. Like, he was he was visible. He was, like, there were four or five shots that weren't meant to be of him, but he's in the background, and dude couldn't even get a mention. That's how <laughs> high-end the celebrity was. That's how high-end the level of celebrity was at Game 1 last night where guy from Counting Crows, and it's obviously him. Nobody else on the planet has that guy's look. By the way, nobody else on the planet wants that guy's look, and it's worked out very well for him, but nobody else wants to look that way. Nobody's watching that game, and it's like, oh, who's that? He kind of looks like the guy from Counting No, he is the guy from Counting Crows, and my man couldn't even get a mention last night. That's what happens when Rihanna and Jay-Z, Kevin Hart, and Jesse Jackson are in the house. I think that Adam Duritz, the front man of Counting Crows, would get a ton of mentions at the 1999 finals between the Spurs and the Knicks and or at any hockey or soccer game in present day America. But at an NBA game, one of this magnitude, round three between the Warriors and the Cavs, they're bringing out the big guns. Right. If Jay-Z and Rihanna are in the building... Adam Duritz is not getting a mention. No, he's And C-list. if Rihanna's in the building, she is the most famous person in the building. I would, for my money, there is no more famous entertainer, athlete, whatever, than Rihanna. She is global, and she's local, too, man. She rides for LeBron James. Yeah. That's something that people either gloss over or pay a lot of attention to. There's no in-between, but she has a noted history of giving him the eyes. Mm-hmm. She and Beyonce, by yeah. the way. 
yeah. who rivals. I, I don't want to get into the whole triangle there and, and yeah. you know, illusions and elevator things and all that stuff. That's not none of my business, none of any of our business. But Rihanna has a noted history of, of making some eyes at one LeBron James. And she actually has an Instagram post where she puts his number 23 on her stomach in sunscreen, which is quite something. God of a lot of attention. And what is hilariously getting a lot of attention today and will until Sunday when we finally have another basketball game to talk about. Hopefully one that's a little more interesting, a little more compelling, preferably closer. She was chirping Kevin Durant. And Kevin Durant noticed no matter what he says, he absolutely noticed. First and last, the podcast. Rihanna was trying to make life miserable for Kevin Durant, chirping brick at him as he stared her down. And then our very own Jeff Van Gundy, our colleague, had something to say about Rihanna, which I didn't know. I, To be honest, I didn't know Jeff Van Gundy knew who Rihanna was. Pass inside. Tristan Thompson finds Jeff. A lot of thunderous dunks here in the opening period. I don't know about this, but Rihanna just walked in front of me. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Stay what are you doing, man? <laughs> Stay with the game. LeBron makes a spectacular play like this, and that's what you deal with? <laughs> yeah. What a play. <laughs> <laughs> LeBron, Lebr- for context, LeBron had just posterized JaVale McGee. It was one of the very few highlights for the Cavs last night. And JVG's mind was, you know what, rightly, somewhere else, because none other than Rihanna had just walked in front of him. Mo, did you do you take JVG, our own Jeff Van Gundy, as a Rihanna guy? No, not no, not at all. Not that which was what made it surprising, not at all. Uh, but I mean, can can you blame him? No, I mean it's certainly if, not. If if Rihanna walked in front of me, no matter what I'm doing, number one, I'm going to notice. Number two, I'm going to have to exclaim. I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to mention it, like either like tap the person that I'm next to, or if I'm broadcasting to tens of millions of people, let them know that Rihanna just walked in front of me. I need this like Durant Rihanna thing. I need this to be like the 21st century version of of Reggie Miller and Spike Lee. Like I need this, I need this to have legs. I need this to happen <laughs> throughout the course of this series. I just hope that this isn't the most interesting storyline to this series because last night it might have been the most interesting thing about that game, KD versus Rihanna. I need something to happen. This is the main uh, objective now for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Give me something more interesting <laughs> than Rihanna versus KD because you couldn't do that in game one. Mo does not ask. Mo does not ask for much. You know what I would do, Mo. If if I saw Rihanna, if I was with some buddies and and saw Rihanna, this is what I would say to the group. We can't have anyone freak out out there, okay? We've got to keep our composure. Yeah. And I don't know if I could keep my composure no, if I, I saw I, I Rihanna. And know. in fact, I, I will regale you guys with a, a brief Rihanna tale in a little while. But speaking of keeping composure, that's what the Cavs need to do going into Game 2 on Sunday at 8 p.m. on ABC and on ESPN Radio. I think that the Cavs are going to make a series of this. But they've got some work to do, and keeping their composure, all jokes aside, is part of that because they have been in this spot before. Well noted. This is the third time in a row that these Cavs have faced these Warriors. It's the seventh time in a row that LeBron James has been to the finals, eighth time overall. that He's played 41 games now. That's half a season of just NBA Finals games. So he has the ability to keep his composure and get his team composed. But beyond keeping their composure, what do the Cavs need to do, Mo? to even this series and make a series of it of it at all. Well, I mean, I think he's, you know, first of all, you're looking for help from from someone. I mean, to, to me, the, the fact that Tristan Thompson was was a no-show last night, that the fact that uh, Kyle Korver really couldn't get anything going and he had some open looks last night, the fact that, I mean, this is just the kind of series, and people are going to point to his rebounding numbers from last night. This is a series, and you kind of saw it often last year, where, where Kevin Love looks like a fish out of water against the Golden State Warriors. We, we make this about LeBron James, and we're, we make everything LeBron James does – about him, and then we we drag Michael Jordan into the conversation. And and by the way, Michael Jordan in the finals never played a team like this Golden State Warriors team. But the the first thing that has to happen is I think Tyron Lue just has to find some other guys that that he can count on. And then that comes back to something we talked about before, which is deciding how we're going to play. Are we going to slow things down 
and grind out games? Are we going to go with a more defensive-oriented lineup and have that come at the at the expense of some offense, or are we going to try to outscore the Golden State Warriors? And I, I don't know what the right answer is. If, if if I knew what the right answer is, somebody in the NBA would have found the right answer over the last three years, and nobody has really done that. So I I think I think you have to figure out who else can they count on in this series, and then it just it it's it's cliche and it's it's it sounds you know overly simple, but you're, you're asking LeBron James to be Superman, to do a little bit of everything in this series. And and last night, while he wasn't awful, last night he wasn't up to the task, and then obviously neither were his teammates. They say in football, in the NFL, the loneliest, the scariest place to be is in your locker room at halftime at the Super Bowl trailing because everything you've done to get to that point, to be in the Super Bowl, hasn't worked. And you have one half of football left to figure it out. It must be scary for these Cavs who have really been a tale of two teams this year, to be in this position knowing that everything they've done to get to this point over this year and the past two years just didn't work against these Warriors. And I say a tale of two teams because they're they're 12-1 and one in these playoffs. And that one loss at the hands of the Celtics was a close one and featured a no-show, surprisingly, from LeBron James, which really never happens in the playoffs. And then they finished, though, the regular season, I believe, 23 and 23, and sort of gave up all pretense of playing defense. Right. And everyone talked going into the playoffs and going into the finals, especially about them being able to flip a proverbial metaphorical switch and, right. and be able to play that defense and be able to turn on the Jets on offense. And they tried to do that at the beginning of yesterday's game in the first quarter. They tried to match the Warriors' pace, which smart basketball people, way smarter than I, pointed out right away was not going to work because you can't match the Warriors' pace. They're too deep. They're too efficient. They've got two MVPs on the floor who play a style of basketball that can't really be replicated. So if you're the Cavs, you're sitting there thinking, man, we've done everything we can to get to where we are. We know how to beat this team, or so we thought. But here we go into Sunday's game two, and we lost the first game by 22 points. Yeah, I lost the first game by 22 points to to a team that left a lot of points out there. You know, I I, I come back uh, I come back to to the the second quarter last night. I think I think Golden State missed eight shots in the paint in the second quarter alone, maybe nine in the second quarter alone. And that that then then you you talk about some of the open threes that they they, they didn't uh, knock down in the second quarter. So it, it I mean it, it could have been a lot worse. Look, you, you you referenced it because coming into the playoffs. What was everybody saying about the Cavaliers? All right, probably still going to waltz through the Eastern Conference, but they're not very good on defense, right? Not very good defensively. And they were a little better against Indiana and uh, good enough against uh, Toronto, and they just outmanned uh, Boston with the exception of of that fluky Game 3 loss. And then we kind of stopped talking about how bad they were defensively. Well, I don't know that, that 12 wins against an underwhelming side of, of the NBA playoff bracket. I don't know that that necessarily means that we should stop talking about this team's defensive deficiencies. I, I don't think they've cured them. So, all right, you're you're deficient on defense. Now we're going to throw at you a team that can, has a guy that can shoot from, you know, anywhere inside the half-court line in Steph Curry. Uh, that, that has, to me, the best pick-and-roll point guard that I've ever seen in Steph Curry. That has uh, a guy who plays center who can knock down threes, a guy, a team that has a seven foot wing player who's the best pin down artist I've ever seen, who can get to the rim, who can make jump shots, who can take anybody off the bounce and Kevin Durant. We're going to throw it to a guy who can can hit from from anywhere beyond the arc and Clay Thompson. And then we're going to throw it to a team that has a better bench and. That against the team in Cleveland that's not good on defense. So you have a, a, they're they're bad on defense as is, and then you address the problems of pace, which was a problem for Cleveland last night. And then you talk about who else besides LeBron James can do anything. And I don't I don't know who those guys in this series. I don't know who those players are going to be. Uh, we, we keep talking about the Cleveland making this a series, and, and again, I, I think that's going to happen. And I go back to two years ago, LeBron almost by himself made it a series. But there's a difference between making it a series and winning the NBA championship, beating this Golden State team four times now in, in six games. I don't know with their defensive deficiencies. 
I don't know with everything they're going to have to try to do and figuring out how to slow down this Golden State team and outscore them at the same time, I don't know how they're going to do that. And we haven't even talked about the glaring number for the Cavaliers last night, which was the 20 turnovers. If they take care of the basketball, this is a tough putt for the Cavs. Then you add to it being careless with the with the rock. It's it's impossible. I again, I I, I think it's going to be a series based on what I've seen from these two teams, and it's only one game. I don't know how they win four of the next six. First and last. Somewhat unsurprisingly, we're talking about the basketball game last night. The Warriors winning 113 to 91 over the Cleveland Cavaliers in game one of these much anticipated, highly contested, or so we thought it would be, NBA Finals. Round three between these two teams. How many rounds? Could we really see between these guys? How many times are these teams going to get back to where they are and where they have been? Our very own Jeff Van Gundy, when he's not thinking about Rihanna walking in front of him during last night's game, had had some interesting points and, and, and an interesting thought about the Warriors' potential for a dynasty run. I, I see no way that Golden State, if they keep their core intact, that they don't go you know, to 5-6 seven straight fi- seven straight more NBA finals. I just don't see who's going to have the firepower to deal with them if healthy. And Adam Silver's right. Everybody appreciates greatness, but they want to see greatness pushed. Pushed and and to make their their greatness come out in tight situations. We haven't had that. Hopefully in the finals we'll get it. Mo Egger, what do you think? About the Warriors going to seven more finals, is that possible? Sure, it is. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Look, look at their core right now. And which, by the way, uh, Clay Thompson's locked up for the next two years. Uh, Draymond Green is is locked up for the next three years after this. Their core right now is Kevin Durant, twenty eight years old; Steph Curry, twenty nine years old; Draymond Green, twenty seven years old; Clay Thompson, twenty seven years old. Uh, a well run front office, a culture that guys want to be a part of. I think they're going to be, you know, like David West is an is an example, a guy toward the end of his career who has a chance to go win a ring. They're certainly going to attract that kind of guy. Um, the the Spurs are are turning the page. Uh, OKC is is no longer a serious threat because Kevin Durant's now at Golden State. Uh, it appears to be time to break up the Los Angeles Clippers. So of course, yeah, I I, I could see this happening. It's you know I, I I said often in in the days leading up to the finals that I I'm all in with Warriors Cavs because to me it's the best rivalry in pro sports and it's it's become that very organically and we have you know different storylines every year. We have storylines that didn't exist last year. I, I'm all in on this series. I hate how we got here. I hate I hate how the minute last year's finals ended. It was almost inevitable that we'd see Cavs Warriors again, and the the minute this year's finals end, however they do with whoever winning, it's going to feel inevitable to me that we're going to be talking Cavs Warriors Part Four. I'm I'm all for you know repeats, and I'm all for dynasties, and I'm all for you know um, the trilogies like we're having right now, and I'd be all for Cavs Warriors Part Four if something else interesting happened, if there was a credible threat to one of these teams, if somebody pushed them. Look, last year you may have said it felt like Golden State was inevitably going to win the championship again, but OKC challenges them, and then Cleveland ultimately wins. This year, we we didn't regard anybody as a legitimate threat. Heck, the, the Boston Celtics won more games than anybody else in the Eastern Conference, earned home court advantage. Nobody thought they were going to get to the NBA Finals. Nobody thought the San Antonio Spurs were going to get to the NBA Finals. And so, yeah, I, I, I could see a run and I'm on board with Golden State going to six or seven consecutive NBA Finals. I just want to see him challenged in the interim, and I don't know, including the Cleveland Cavaliers, who consistently is going to challenge them. I completely agree on your position regarding dynasties being fun to watch and being all in on Cavs Warriors and the fact that the way that we've gotten here is kind of frustrating as a fan. I like when the regular season matters. I like when the players are trying, when they're not sitting out just to rest because it's some throwaway game in in whatever month that isn't April or May or June. And I I want those games to matter as a fan. I like watching good, high-quality basketball where maximum effort is given at all times. The one one area where I, I do disagree with you, though, is you mentioned that this rivalry has happened organically. And I don't mean to parse phrases here, but I don't think it's very organic 
for Kevin Durant to have shown up, to have descended from the clouds. The rest of the rivalry, yes, because the other core guys have been on each team for the past couple of years. But Durant helicoptered in to a pretty damn good situation with these Warriors coming off a 73-win regular season. So there's nothing organic about that. And, of course, he's getting killed either way. If he wins, he's a front runner. If he loses, he's a choke artist. So he, he could just do whatever he wants because we were going to criticize him no matter what. But I just dispute the notion that it's an organic addition to the rivalry. What's not organic about it? It's, it's, it's one of the best players in the league joining the best rivalry in the sport. That, that's very organic. Look, Kevin Durant is not in Oakland because the Warriors could pay him the most money. He's in Oakland because they have the best franchise. That occurred organically. And, and what you then get, what you benefit from there, you know, Kevin Durant said this last week uh, about, hey, look, it's, it's not my fault that there's no parity in this league. It's not my fault that teams like the Orlando Magic and the Brooklyn Nets and the New York Nets, I'm, I'm paraphrasing them here, but it's not my fault that their front offices aren't getting the job done. So what, what happens is now in this league, which is a capped league and where, you know, stars can make the max, there's a maximum salary per player, um, is – the best organizations, the best run organizations end up getting the best players. That only happens through things like the draft and developing a good locker room culture and maintaining some continuity in the front office and with the coaching staff. And then you benefit from things like Kevin Durant being available. That couldn't be more organic. The rivalry itself developed very organically. Cavs Warriors meant back-to-back finals. This, this to me, would be less interesting if Kevin Durant wasn't here. I mean, to me, what, what spiced this up was it wasn't the same two teams that had met the previous two years. It was many of the same characters, but now we bring in this other guy call it what you want, but that that's that's a very good part of the rivalry, and I view that as very organic. I view that as, as very natural. In the NBA, it's not like Major League Baseball where bad teams go ahead and get the best guys because they happen to occupy a big market and can go ahead and pay more than anybody else. In the NBA, the Brooklyn Nets aren't getting big free agents, and the Orlando Magic aren't getting big free agents, and the New York Knicks aren't getting big big free agents. They're not getting those guys because their 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 front offices are garbage, because their organizations are poorly run, because they make awful decisions, because they have no continuity, and because they have awful culture. So you get those things going in your favor. You're then going to land Kevin Durant. Yes or no, is the NBA a two-team league? Um, it's not a two-team league. I, I would say it's, it's, it's a league defined by a handful of stars, most of whom happen to be on two teams. <laughs> well, so... <laughs> so, yes, I find oh, it's so a... So that's a yes? It's, it's a two-team it's a two league. And, and okay. again, therein, well, lies, just, therein lies my frustration with where we are now. Because even last year, even last year, as great as the Warriors were in the regular season, you thought, you know what? San Antonio might be able to beat them four times. You didn't feel that way this year. You didn't feel that way about Golden State this year. I'm not sure we feel that way about Golden State right now. At some point, whether it's via trades, whether it's via free agency, whatever it is, now the next step is, great, we have Cav- Cavs Warriors. Give me a challenger to the the two thrones. Right. And I don't know how that's going to happen in the next four months. A lot of people do think it's a two-team league, and one person who is on the other side of that argument is the commissioner. Of the NBA, Adam Silver, he was on Mike and Mike earlier this week. He, he does not believe that this is a two-team league. Take a listen. There's one premium league, basketball league, in the world, and there are literally tens of millions of young men playing this game. It's just hard for me to fathom how there becomes this perception that at the moment there are only two teams that are truly competitive in this league. I just don't believe it. Now, I'm of the persuasion that had Kevin Durant stayed put in Oklahoma City, it would be a three, maybe four-team league if you include the Spurs. I believe that the Cavs are just far and away the best team in the East. Any team with LeBron James, pencil them in in a very dark shade of gray for the finals every year until he retires, in my opinion. And in the West, the Warriors are in a class of their own, but had Durant stuck around, I think that the parity would have existed to a greater extent than it does now when everyone knew that the Warriors were going to be facing those Cavs in the finals. And if you're Adam Silver, now with this cap situation, everyone is getting so paid. How do you prevent players from from just sort of going where they know they can win a ring? Uh, I, I don't know. There, there's a part of me that thinks that's really good for the league because, you know, we're in this, this day and age. I mean, the cap took such a leap last year. Here are some of the contracts that guys signed last all season. Uh, Bismack Biombo signed four years and $72 million. Have any idea who he even is? 
Yes, I do, yeah. because he tried to fight LeBron last year in right. the playoffs. That's, that's how you know. Timothy Mozgov signed four years, 64 mil. <laughs> he gets paid so much money. I right. have him up on, on my screen as well. Right. So there's there's all these all this. The, the money is huge. Everybody's making money, right? So now the ultimate currency is winning. Now the ultimate currency in the NBA is winning. What 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 you do, and, and you have no legislative power over doing this, what you do is you encourage franchises to not be dumpster fires. You tell James Dolan and Phil Jackson in New York, hey, get get your act together. You tell the, the, the owners in, in places like Brooklyn and to a lesser extent maybe Philadelphia and Orlando and in places where they haven't won in forever, and you tell them uh, to get your act together. Look, the, 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 the Golden State Warriors have been a very well-run franchise for a while now. In fact, they've been a well-run franchise you know, for for such a long time that it predates them making NBA Finals. So, all right, so let's let's have more of those. Let's let's have more well-run organizations where we're not making knee-jerk decisions, we're not cycling through coaches, we're not making uh, horrendous decisions financially, and you'll have situations that star players want to go to that, or you remove the salary cap and and you allow players to just go and chase dollars. That's the other way to do it. You want a you want a better distribution of your star players. Let open bidding start in this league. Well, the owners aren't going to go for that because that means collectively they're going to be pocketing less money. And so right now you have to figure out a way as a league to weather this storm and hope that, to use a word we've beaten to death so far, organically somebody else emerges in this league to threaten the teams you have at the top. But the, the, the NBA, it's built in. I think the last the last 30 titles have been won by 11 teams combined. It, it's always yeah. been a league defined by a handful of teams. But the Bulls had challengers. Felt like, you know, the Knicks were a challenger to them, or the Cavaliers or the Pacers. They had challengers. The, the, the Celtics in the 80s had challengers, whether it was Detroit or, or Philadelphia or Atlanta. It, it, it's okay to have these, these dynasty-type teams. I'm just, as a fan, give me somebody else in the mix that makes it interesting and doesn't make it feel inevitable that the same teams are going to win. I'm with you. And if you want to say it's a two-team league, that's up to you. If you want to crown them, then crown them. First. And last, the podcast. So we got to expand uh, and, and take some calls here. And we're going to start very quickly with Steve in Minnesota, who has an absurd take on the Minnesota Timberwolves. No, I'm not going to talk absurdly. But my question is, how soon do you think Tom Thibodeau and the, the new GM who came from San Antonio, how soon do you think they can – make the Wolves competitive where they're not only going to the playoffs, but they're actually com- competing and doing well against Golden State. Well, I was, I was not Hold on, expecting. hold on. I want to defend my own call screening. When he <laughs> called in, he said the T-Wolves were right on the call. Right, cop. so that's why, I just a little behind the scenes, the reason that I led with Steve in Minnesota is because producer guy Dan Z said, look, we got a call from a guy who thinks the T-Wolves are right on the cusp, and I had this whole plan, Mo of him telling me that, uh, of Steven Minnesota telling me the T-Wolves were out on the cusp and we could kind of laugh and say, no, not quite, let's take some more calls, which we're going to do in a second. But uh, quickly, uh, Mo, what do you think? T-Wolves they, on the cusp, yes or no? They went 31-51 and 51 this year. little more improvement to do. All right, let's let's uh, let's go to Andrew in Florida. How's it going, guys? Good, man. How are you? I, I'm doing all right. I think the easiest way to make it more than a two-team league is don't give the number one pick to the worst team in the league. Give it to the team that barely misses the playoffs. you got somebody like where I'm from, Miami, or maybe the Nuggets. You give them Markel Foltz, Lonzo Ball, Josh Jackson. Now they're a little bit closer, one more year, one free agent, and it's a lot better than the Nets or the Celtics. But, the Celtics got lucky because somebody made the worst trade in NBA history. But hold on. But Don't, you, doesn't that mean that you can, like, if you're on the – cusp of the playoffs and you're that means you're the eight seed and you're going to play the uh either the warriors or the Cavs, depending on your conference why would you not just drop out mo out of the playoffs tank a few games not the whole season just take a few games to get the nine seed and the best record of the non-playoff teams to get that number one pick yeah it, it, would, it would create a different type of tanking yeah there, there's no doubt about this and 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 if you're if you're putting all your eggs in in the basket of of rookies coming in and, and remaking teams instantly that's that's a uh, a path to failure. That's that's not going to happen. The, these teams aren't going to make market improvements on with with rookies. Now you make market improvements by drafting and developing and 
the aforementioned Minnesota Timberwolves have started that process with Carl Anthony Towns. But yeah, you're you're right. You're going to start a, a whole new a whole new uh, way of tanking, which mm-hmm. is something the league is already having a hard time with. Yes. All right. We'll go to Adam in Indiana. What's up, man? How you doing? I was just trying to call about the uh, comment about the two team league. Okay. Yeah. Please. Let's uh, let's hear it. You're on. Uh, before Kawhi Leonard got hurt in Game One, the Spurs were up by twenty. Now the Spurs probably would have only won two games. But next year, with talking to Chris Paul going there, where he could be a floor general and not a scorer, and possibly give Marcus Aldridge 22, and Kawhi is 28, he puts in about 16, 10, and 10, they'd be a contender. Also, with Boston having the number one pick, they taught Isaiah Thomas, we're not going to give you max money. They can throw max money at Paul George and Gordon Hayward, go with Lonzo Ball, their punk over the future if uh, Isaiah Thomas wants to sign for less money. Those are. Uh... Those are some big assumptions to make. We Chris Paul has not gone yet to the Spurs, and who knows if he will. And we also don't know who the Celtics are going to pick, but they do have uh, the best odds that they're going to do the number one pick. And I think that, uh, I don't know, I, I suppose if everything falls that way, then, yeah, I, I guess there would be challengers in each conference mode to, to these top two teams, and it might make it a little more interesting, but I still think that the Warriors and the Cavs are just so much better than everyone else, no matter what. Chris Paul makes the Spurs better, but the San Antonio Spurs, they've they've lost 16 of their last 33 playoff games. Yeah. You know, and look, you, you can run at me the, the whole, you know, Kawhi Leonard if he doesn't get injured. And, and yeah, maybe game one plays out differently, and, and maybe that series as a whole plays out differently. You're still going to have a hard time convincing me that the San Antonio Spurs would have would have won that series, and and I know there were other injuries. Tony Parker wasn't available. Uh, David Lee got injured, but but they weren't competitive. They were th- those those last two games in San Antonio felt like preseason games, not regular season games. They felt like preseason games. And the Boston thing, yeah, you you can go get Gordon Hayward, and there's a, a connection there because he played for Brad Stevens at Butler, and 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 maybe they can get a Paul George, and and it's great that they have the uh, the the number one overall pick. That Boston team, and I know Isaiah Thomas didn't play the last three games, again, the gap between them and the Cleveland Cavaliers was immense. And it's not being filled by a free agent, and it's not being filled by the number one pick in the draft. And by the way, none of those guys that he just mentioned uh, solves their biggest problem in Boston, which is rebounding. They need a big. They need a big to even have a chance to compete with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Thank you for listening to the first and last podcast. You can listen and subscribe to all ESPN podcasts in the listen tab of the ESPN app. First and last.